open at 7 o'clock in the morning, some results could be very close, with tactical voting playing a part. Here's Andrew Sinclair. Yes, thanks, Susie. No big visits to the region today for the first time in this campaign. But, like the party leaders, the candidates are working throughout the day to try to win over voters, particularly in the marginal seats. Now, Luton South is probably the most interesting in our region. Twelve candidates standing there. The day started with them all taking part in a debate on Three Counties Radio. Then it was back onto the campaign trail. The Lib Dem candidate and his megaphone visited villages on the outskirts of his constituency. The Conservatives had extra volunteers in preparing leaflets while their candidates sat in the car phoning floating voters. And Labour Party activists, meanwhile, were out delivering letters and knocking on doors. And this sort of thing has been going on in seats across the region today. Now, this is the map of the region. There's Luton South, one of 11 Labour seats, which have really been the main battleground in this election. The big question tomorrow, how many of these will Labour hang on to? All of these close to the M1 corridor, close to London, have majorities of just a few thousand. Over on the East Coast, they're considered to be a bit safer. The other big question... How will the Lib Dem surge play in this region? They've got three seats at the moment, uh, North Norfolk, Colchester and Cambridge. Will they get any more? Norwich South is a big target seat. South East Cambridgeshire is now in their sights after the problems with Labour's candidate there. And then there's the whole issue of tactical voting, which some Labour ministers have started talking about. In all these seats, the Liberal Democrats are in second place. If Labour voters backed them instead of Labour, they could cause an upset. Now, one of those seats is Chelmsford. It was won last time by the Conservatives, but the boundaries have been changed, so it gives them now a notional majority of just 3,700. And as you can see, the Lib Dems are not far behind. With less than 24 hours to go before the polls open, in Chelmsford, candidates are out meeting potential voters. So what would happen in this constituency if people were to vote tactically? Now imagine these three strips of fabric represent the three main political parties in their race to the finishing line. After the 2005 general election, this is what it looked like. There was a Conservative majority, Liberal Democrats came second, and in third place were Labour. But if people were to vote tactically tomorrow and those Labour voters decided to vote Liberal Democrat, the two combined votes could change the colour of the final result. Figures from the 2005 election study show in this region around 350,000 people voted tactically. You have to look at your local constituency and decide how should I vote in order to get the person elected that I most want that will give me the government I most want. So in fact, um, arguably, morally speaking, everybody should be tactical voters. I think you should vote for the party that you believe in or who you want to see running the country. It depends how strong you feel on the issues, really, I think, and how strong you may not want somebody um, re-elected. Tactics here tomorrow could mean the election becomes a two-horse race. Felicity Simper, BBC Look East. Well, later in Look East, has the election campaign done anything to change the minds of our viewers' panel? It's certainly done nothing to improve the weather. Jim has tonight's chilly forecast later. And if you've never been inside a polling... An animal rescue shelter in Suffolk has been saved after plans to close it were scrapped. Thousands of people campaigned to keep the Blue Cross Centre in Felixstowe open. For months, its future's been uncertain. But today, the waiting was over. We were really ecstatic and, uh, yes, really, really pleased because it's part of the community. It's brilliant news. It's the, uh, it's the decision we wanted. There's been a Blue Cross Centre in Felixstowe since 1947. It rehomes over 400 cats and dogs a year from Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex and Cambridgeshire. But then in January, the charity announced plans to shut it, arguing it could spend its limited funds more wisely elsewhere. Within days, the centre's manager realised people weren't prepared to let it happen. When I first came to Felixstowe, I noticed that there was a very high level of public support there. Um, and I expected something to come out when the, when the proposals to close the centre went in, but nothing to this magnitude. Just mind-blowing, mind-blowing. What the Blue Cross underestimated was the level of support for this centre. Hundreds turned out for a march. 16,500 signed a petition. The television presenter, Peter Purvis, described the closure plans as absurd. Today, on hearing the centre had been saved, he said he was absolutely delighted. 
What we're trying to do is actually do a bit of everything. Continue to move forward with the plans and go to areas where we need, uh, where our services are needed, but also help animals here. So we're compromising the plans a little to enable, enable us to stay here. The hard work now begins. The charity needs to raise a million pounds to upgrade the centre and buy extra land. And it hopes those who fought so hard to save it from closure will now help to raise the money needed. Richard Daniel, BBC Look East, Felixstowe. The village post office at Cable St Mary in Suffolk has been raided for the second time in a week. This morning a man walked into the shop with a gun and demanded cash. The police say the two robberies are linked. It's the fourth raid in two years. A sixth person has been arrested after a man was found with life-threatening injuries in Orwell Country Park in Ipswich. The 20-year-old local woman is being questioned on suspicion of attempted murder. Police are also questioning a local man and have released four others on bail. Forensic scientists say they've been amazed by the discovery in Ipswich of African skeletons dating back to the 13th century. They use techniques normally seen in TD, TV detective shows to find out more about them and why they were there. A grisly glimpse into Ipswich past. This skeleton was amongst 150 discovered in a part of the town that's long since been redeveloped. The skeletons were found where a friary once stood in this part of Ipswich. Unfortunately, all that's left of that friary now are these arches built into the bottom of an office block. An archaeologist showed me exactly where he made the find, in an aptly named street. Of the 150, quite a few of them were very unusual. Um, there were a lot with fractures, for example, there were people with TB, there were lepers, and really interestingly, there were nine that appeared to be African in origin. So the discovery of the 13th century skeletons triggered a 21st century investigation. The initial observation has confirmed that he was male. Forensic scientists used modern techniques to find out what an African was doing in Ipswich way back in the 13th century. And two of the scientists involved spoke to BBC Breakfast. We have physical proof for the very first time that there were African individuals in medieval yes. England. I think that's the real exciting yeah. bit about yeah. this particular story. Yes, it is. I mean, I've come across one or two in written records, but uh, there's nothing like it excavating a good cemetery to turn out really interesting <laughs> evidence. Yeah. It's now thought he was brought to England from Tunisia during the Ninth Crusade. History Cold Case is on BBC Two at 9 o'clock tomorrow evening. Gareth George, BBC Look East. Flights from East Anglia uh, to Scotland and Ireland will be reviewed at 7 o'clock because of the volcanic dust. 15 airports have been closed today. There's been some disruption at Stansted, but Norwich Airport had few problems. You should check with your airline before setting out. Production of free-range turkeys is being tripled at Bernard Matthews. The Norfolk-based company is buying a producer in Lincolnshire, Lynx Turkeys, which specialises in free-range and fresh birds. Bernard Matthews has recruited the chef Marco Pierre White to promote its turkey products. Norwich City are planning an open-top bus parade to celebrate their promotion to the championship. It will be on the 13th of May and up to 40,000 fans are expected to line the streets. They won League One with two games to spare. Now Norwich City Football Club is planning its party. It's sensational that the players have done so well to be 12 points clear with one game to go. Extraordinary when you consider we had uh, one point from the first nine points. Um, so it's been a, a massive turnaround and that's all down to Paul Lambert, his management team and the players. The it's been a barren few years since the city was last draped in yellow. 40,000 people celebrated winning the old first division in 2003. And on May the 13th, the open top bus will travel to Norwich Castle. Costs shared by the club, sponsors Aviva, the city and county councils and the police. In terms of the promotion for the city as a whole, then it's quite a good investment to do this anyway because it does raise our profile. It gives people uh, an understanding that we are an ambitious and successful city and the Canaries are very much a kind of totem for us. As a warm-up, 25,000 fans will be in celebratory mode on Saturday for the last home game of the season, although the chairman's urging fans not to invade the pitch and spoil the party. And Janet Gadgill, BBC Look East, Norwich.